you, Catherine. Good morning. So this um, prevalence data that Catherine has talked about, they've been very helpful in helping us to figure out how many kids in the population get, get bullied. Maybe we'll know something about the age and the gender of the kids, how, whether things are getting better or worse over time. But what it really doesn't tell us is who are the kids that get victimized and are there some kids or groups of kids that might be particularly at risk. So one of the contributions of the report was to try to bring attention to vulnerable groups who are maybe most at risk for bullying by their peers. Um, and so we've, oh geez, gosh, I'm trying to look in two places at the same time. So we've been identifying several vulnerable groups and Lost my place. And the groups that the research suggests that may be particularly vulnerable are LGBT youth. So the, pre the prevalence rates that you saw in Catherine's presentation are much higher in LGBT youth, 25 to 45%. Um, we, and, and transgender youth are a particular population of interest now compared to kids who aren't transgender or who aren't LGB, kids who are, are transgender are reporting much higher rates of, of bullying. Um, that's certainly not inconsistent with the political issues that, that we know are confronting our country right now today. Kids with disabilities, these are also a particularly vulnerable group. It's been hard to disentangle which, which types of, of disabilities make kids most vulnerable, but we do know that kids with autism are particularly vulnerable to, to bullying by their peers. And obese youth, you know, over 30% of the population, the kids under the age of 19, are either overweight or obese. And we know that being obese or overweight is a risk factor. And so such youth are much more likely to be, be picked on by their peers. And with, with obese youth, you also see this cyclical process in that you're picked on, you're already overweight, you become inactive it, as a way of coping with peer harassment, you gain more weight, and then you're, you're even more vulnerable to harassment by your peers. So cyclical, cyclical process are op processes are operating there. Is that better? So there are other groups where the research just isn't there, but these also appear to be vulnerable groups. So kids who differ in SES, it isn't just the low SES kids who might be vulnerable. There's some re research suggesting that high SES, that 1%, that they're also vulnerable to harassment by their peers. Immigrant status, um, kids who are religious minorities, hate crimes are growing, religious hate crimes are growing in the country and in schools. So kids who are religious minorities, such as Muslim youth, might be particularly vulnerable. And youth with multiple stigmatized statuses. In psychology, we, we, we refer to this as intersectionality. So one might ask, is the African-American boy who's gay more at risk than the Latina lesbian. So looking at, in this case, looking at race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation as intersecting identities, and we really don't know much about that yet. And urban versus <coughs> rural youth. You know, our naive beliefs would be that urban kids, especially those living in concentrated poverty and exposed to violence, might be more at risk for bullying in their schools. But in fact, the research through on prevalence suggests that rural kids are just as likely to be bullied as urban kids. And some of the school contextual factors that might be more problematic for rural kids, there are fewer school transitions in rural schools, so you don't have as many opportunities to find a new peer group and redefine your identity. But more research clearly needs to be done on these groups. Um, we are also looking, you know, most of the research, as you'll see in, in our report, is very descriptive. So you identify characteristics of kids, for example, and then you look to see the extent to which they might be 
vulnerable to harassment by their peers. But the, but the phenomenon is much more complex than that. And we know that kids are located in context and that there are some contexts that might be particularly protective. So even if you do have one of these characteristics that puts you more at risk for being picked on by your peers, if the schools are, are endorsing certain kinds of programs or if you have friends, you might be, but you might be more protected from the consequences of peer harassment. So we've been trying to take this ecological perspective where kids are located in friendship groups and families and peer groups and schools and looking to see whether or not these different contexts function as protective factors. Was I too close? Is that better? Um, and with the landscape of bullying, now this is a complex slide, but I just want to highlight two things here. The peer group, we know that the peer group is really important in helping kids cope with the experience of bullying. And it isn't just the perpetrator and the target of, of, of the perpetrator's actions. We know that um, bullying experiences involve multiple people in multiple roles. So there's not only the perpetrators and the targets, there are kids who come to the aid of the perpetrator. There are kids, unfortunately fewer, who come to the aid and try to defend the target. And there are a lot of kids who just stand by and do nothing, and these are bystanders. So we want to be able to understand peer harassment, peer bullying as more of a group phenomenon. And some interventions, as Catherine will talk about, have been particularly targeted to bystanders. Why is it that bystanders don't come to the aid of, of kids who are targeted um, by others for harassment? And it seems to get worse with age. People often think that the, the target of, of bullying brings his or her problems on him or herself. Um, we also know that schools are an important factor. Schools are an important context. Research is coming out on some things that schools can do, like organizing instruction. So counterintuitively, perhaps, that um, teaming, small group learning, sometimes that doesn't work to the advantage of kids who are victimized because you're with the same kids all day. And again, you don't have an opportunity to read find your identity or find a new peer group. School classroom norms are really important. So if your school has a norm or a general consensus that we don't tolerate bullying or the opposite, that bullying is okay, it's the popular kids who do it, everybody kinds of accept, kind of accepts it. So peer norms, um, classroom and school norms are really important. And also the way schools organize instruction. So research suggests that when discipline is fair, Everybody believes that people are treated the same. And when discipline is meted out with warmth and support, that those two dimensions, fairness and warmth, just like in parenting, fairness and warmth and discipline, um, schools ha are less likely to have a serious problem with bullying. Okay. Um, so when we talk about vulnerable groups, we really are getting to the root cause of why are kids picked on by others? And stigma in psychological research is an identity, a social identity that's devalued in the eyes of other people. Not necessarily myself, but in the eyes of other people. And so we, be we can begin to think about LGBT youth and obese youth and religious minority youth and intersectional youth as having identities that are devalued in the eyes of others. And once we begin to think about bullying in that context, we focus more on the causes, the perpetrators, and we are more likely to be thinking as in the discrimination literature about stereotypes and prejudices. And so our intervention approaches can begin to think about what can we do societally and with kids in schools to reduce prejudice and reduce stereotypes and increase tolerance for difference different for tolerance for people who are different from you. So one of, that's one of the contributions of our report to bring greater attention to stigmatized to being bullied, the reasons for bullying as, as social stigmas and bias-based bullying, which has to do with denigrating someone just because they're a member of a particular group, a particular stigmatized group. So we want to bring much more attention to bullying and as stigma and bias-based bullying than heretofore in the research.
So recommendations that we want to um, promote the evaluation of the role of stigma and bias in bullying behavior and sponsor the development, implementation, and evaluation of evidence-based programs to address stigma and with the goal of addressing stigma and bias-based bullying, including stereotypes and prejudice that may underlie such behavior. Um, I want to just say a couple of words about the online context. You know, it's becoming increasingly important in understanding bullying in our contemporary world. And the online context is very is different in many ways from the in-person context. And first of all, um, you have this 24-7 experience, and so it's really hard to get away from it. It's really hard to figure out how you're going to come to the aid of the victim of, of, of bullying when it's happening all the time, these viral experiences, so it completely changes the meaning and the experience of repeated exposure to victimization, the anonymity of it. It's hard to articulate or determine the imbalance of power, and again, it's hard to come to the aid of the target target of, of bullying online. So there are many unique features of the online context which are, are different in some ways from our definition of bullying and make it more difficult to think about how we're going to intervene. And in terms of, specifically in terms of recommendations for the online bullying, we are advocating the adoption, implementation, and evaluation on an online, on an ongoing basis by social media policies and programs and public, we're encouraging social media programs, um, companies to publish anti-bullying policies on their websites and with the goal of preventing, identifying, and responding to bullying on social media platforms. Consequences, this is probably the longest chapter in our volume, so I'm gonna to have to just say a few quick things about consequences. We know there are physical health consequences of being the target of bullying. Bullying is a very stressful event, so all of the research that we know comes from the biological consequences of stress. You see that enacted in the bullying context also. Kids who are chronic targets of bullying have sleep problems, they have gastrointestinal problems. There's also research coming out at the neurobiological level, although I want to provide the caveat here, as in the report, that we're never going to be saying that the brains of bullies and targets of bully, bullies and, and targets of bullying are different in any way, but there is research, for example, suggesting that the same areas of the prefrontal cortex get activated in social pain as physical pain, which underscores the serious nature and the problematic impact of these chronic experiences with, with um, uh, with harassment. Um, we know that there are mental health consequences. It's pretty, the findings are pretty robust. The kids who are targets of bullying have low self, especially chronic targets, have low self-esteem. They feel anxious, depressed, lonely, and they're highly rejected by their peers. And there are academic consequences. There are some inconsistency in the literature because not every target of bullying disengages from school, but many do because you no longer have the emotional and the cognitive resources to pay attention to your schoolwork. So there are some academic consequences to being the target of bullying also. Um, I just wanna make a particular point because these issues got stressed in the report. Um, the public often thinks that Bullying is associated with school shootings. And we want to make it clear that there's no profile in existence now of the sh school shooter, that school shootings are rare events, although it, it, it ends up being related to this literature because those who have done retrospective studies and archival studies have looked back and kids who are, and young adults who, who do, who, who have been the perpetrators of these school shootings Often they have a history of peer difficulties, but in no way can we say that there's any causal relationship between being the target of bullying and school shootings. And similarly, even though kids who are targets of bullying often report thinking about suicide and have more suicide attempts than typically developing kids, there is no causal link between the experience of bullying and suicide. 
last thing I want to say is about mediating mechanisms. So, you know, why are we having all these negative, particularly mental health consequences of being the target of, of bullying? And so two likely mediators, psychological mediators that might explain this relationship are what we are calling self-blame. You know, if I'm a chronic target of bullying and I blame myself, I think it's me, it's always going to be this way, there's nothing that I can do about it, I'm much more likely to have these negative mental health consequences. And secondly, if I'm not very good at regulating my emotions, then I might also be especially a target, I mean, especially vulnerable to these negative mental health consequences of being the target of bullying. So self-blame and emotion dysregulation seem to be important mediators of these relationships. We want to encourage the Department of Health, Human Services, and the, U and the U.S. Department of Education to support the development, implementation, and evaluation of evidence-informed bullying prevention training for individuals who work directly with children and adolescents on a regular basis. That's the teachers and the counselors and the um, uh, school resource officers, to name a few. And we want to do this to increase knowledge and awareness of bullying among those on the front lines.